And if you have a Bible or something you read your Bibles on, uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 9 this morning. So you can go ahead and get there. We'll be there in a little bit. And today we're going to be starting a journey with Jesus. Between Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 19, we have this long journey with Jesus. And, And where is it that he is headed? Well, if you know the title of our sermon series, you've probably seen it. You might know where he's going. Today we're kicking off a series that's going to take us up to Easter, and it's called Determined to Die. Uh, We're going to, through this series, kind of walk up to Easter, and we're going to celebrate on that day the truth that Jesus is no longer dead, that he is alive. But to get to the empty tomb, you first must go through the cross. And that's what we're going to attempt to do with Jesus. And what I want to set out this morning in this first message in this series, I want to draw this point out from God's Word. Those determined to walk intentionally with Jesus, have counted the cost, and have found his way worth it. Let me say that one more time because I think I said intentional no, 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 <laughs> Those determined to walk intentionally with Jesus have counted the cost and found his way worth it. Tuck that away. This whole message is going to be kind of built around that. This whole series is kind of built around that idea. Uh, 2017, there was a news report that came out of Des Moines, Iowa, and I want to read the opening line of this news report. It says this, the world is peppered with people who can coax small seeds of inspiration into richly flowering ideas that put humankind on a better path. And then there's that guy in Des Moines. It seems that early one morning on Interstate 80 in, in Iowa, a state patrol officer attempted to pull over a man who was speeding. And when he attempted to pull over this man, the man stepped on the gas and he led the police into what turned out to be a 10 to 15 minute pursuit all along I-80. It finally ended when the car tried to evade the police by getting off the freeway and going down onto surface streets. And the police performed one of those pit maneuvers. You know, if you've ever watched Cops or something like that, where they hit like the back corner of the, of the vehicle and it spins it out. And when the policeman walked up to the window, what should have been a routine traffic stop and he asks this 46 year old why in the world did you lead us on this chase do you know what his answer was a police chase was an item on my bucket list and i decided to cross it off this morning (laughs) and the sergeant that stepped up to the car and said that he said in his 30 years of law enforcement that was the first time the bucket list excuse had ever been used and you're familiar with that phrase right the bucket list uh that list of things you want to check off before you die it was made popular by that 2007 movie that was called The Bucket List. It wasn't a clever name. They just picked what they wanted the movie to be about and called it um, like the Jungle Book. It's not about a book. It's about like animals and stuff, right? But this guy, he, he had a bucket list item to lead the police on a chase. Well, according to a recent study of the top things that are on people's bucket lists in the U.S., one of the top ones, top item was to get healthier or lose weight. That was the top item on people's bucket list. Obviously, you want to leave behind a good-looking body behind, I guess, right? You want, to, you want to be healthy, try to prolong the inevitable as much as possible. Some of the others, and I want to show you these on the screen. Travel to an exotic location. Uh, achieve a wealth goal. And when people were asked about the wealth goal they wanted to achieve, one of the top ones is to pay off student loans, which I would argue if you die, who wins? Who wins in the student loan battle if you die before you get those paid off? Uh, see a natural wonder. Own your own home. Change someone else's life for the better. Get married. Have children. Start my own business or do an extreme sport like bungee jumping or skydiving. Anybody checked any of those off yet? You, you, you hit all of these. Will, don't raise your hand. You've not done anything. You've not done any of this stuff. <laughs> Many of these, like they're, they're like this fun stuff you want to do before you go, right? Well, what if the clock was ticking faster? Let's say we brought it forward. What if you knew your days were numbered? And your time was limited, your end was near. Well, another survey asked 100 people what you would do if you knew you only had 24 hours to live. I want you to hear the difference in this list. The top one was to bring loved ones together. Second on the list was to spend time with your partner, your friends, or your family. Uh, Say goodbye. Thank everyone for everything. Apologize to all the people you've harmed during your life. Maybe in some of my parts of my life, maybe take a little more than 24 hours for some of us in that right and then finally the last one was leave everything in order before my departure that list looks so much different it looks so much different than all of those other fun things that people would want to check off before they go well how would we spend our final time on this earth if we knew the end was near 
Would it look different if you had a specific amount of years? Months? Weeks? Days? Hours? Minutes? Seconds? I mean, what, what would look different about your life if you knew the end was coming? Would we have some big important list of stuff we'd like to check off? How would we even know to determine what was most important in our lives to do before the end came? For some, maybe we wouldn't do anything. We'd just sit around living in fear of that end date to come. Well, the story from the life of Jesus that we're looking at this morning in Luke chapter 9, it comes at a time when Jesus begins to shift his disciples' focus to the fact that he was going to die. And I want you to know something. Up until this point in, in, this, in this story, up until this time, they are all in on following Jesus. He was an awesome teacher. He, he was a miracle worker. He was one that they considered to be the Messiah, meaning God's anointed. He was the fulfillment of all of God's promises right here in the flesh, and they had given up everything to follow him. They had such high hopes for Jesus. When he called them, they went, and they had such high hopes for what he was pointing them towards in their lives. But here, in Luke chapter 9, there's a dramatic shift. And Jesus begins pointing them towards another reality that he had always known. And I want you to catch how Jesus puts this in Luke chapter 9, verses 22 through 24. And he said, talking about himself, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. When I read this passage of scripture, I realize that Jesus knows what's up here. (laughs) Jesus knows what is going on with the thrust of his life. He knows about the suffering. He knows about the rejection. He knows about the death that is soon to come over the horizon. And Jesus tells his disciples, he says, if you want to follow me, then you better be prepared for some of this stuff to come in your own life. If you want to follow me, then you too need to understand that there's a possibility that you will be rejected. There too comes this possibility that you will suffer, in some cases physically, maybe even physical death. But for sure to follow me, it means you're going to die to your own dreams. It means you're going to die maybe to your own desires or maybe to the way you thought this life was supposed to go. You better be prepared to let some of that stuff go if you're going to follow me. And the disciples might not have completely understood what Jesus is getting at in this passage of Scripture. They definitely didn't understand what was coming, even though he just plainly told them all of this was about to happen. But Jesus would show them all of this over and over as he travels towards Jerusalem and he travels towards his eventual death. Perhaps when they see that Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem, maybe they think that finally Jesus is going in and he's going to conquer this place. He's going to go in and he's going to throw out the, the oppressors. He's going to go overthrow the city and he is going to finally be this king that we've been expecting. Instead, what was awaiting them? Death, an excruciating, humiliating death upon a cross. And to follow Jesus on this road that he was about to walk, they too would need to take up their crosses, experiencing rejection, experiencing suffering right along beside Jesus. How would we have taken this at this point in the story? At this point in the disciples' lives, they had witnessed and they had been a part of some amazing things in Jesus. Jesus had just sent them out at the beginning of Luke chapter 9 to go out and to teach and to preach. And they had healed many in Jesus' name. And when they came back even, they had been a part of the feeding of what the Bible tells us is a number of 5,000 men, not counting women and children. They saw this in their midst and they got to help it as Jesus blessed the bread and he blessed the fish and he put it in their hands and he let them go hand it out. And they handed it out to this huge number. And then they went and gathered all that was left over. Well, Peter had even just declared that Jesus was God's Messiah. And what is he saying when he says this? Well, he's saying, well, you're the one, Jesus. We know who you say you are, and we know who God says you are. We know what this means. You're going to rule, you're going to reign in power, and we're going to be right there with you. That's what Peter is saying when he declares that Jesus is God's Messiah. But just a few verses after that, Jesus tells them in Luke chapter 9, verse 21, don't tell anyone. Really? You're all of this, and you're telling us not to tell anyone? See, a little bit later in this chapter, when they begin this journey to Jerusalem, something happens. 
Something is different. Something changes in the way that Jesus is now determined to get to where he needs to go. And this is our theme verse for this passage. This is our theme verse for this whole series. And it starts in verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went on to another village. Whatever translation you're reading, and I know we had the NIV up here, but whatever Bible translation is your go-to, if you've got it on your phone, if you've got it in your lap, wherever you're reading, maybe there's some different words there instead of resolutely set out. Uh, We see the word, set his face was one such word that would be used there. And that phrase was a common um, idiom, one of those phrases often used in the Old Testament. And what that meant to set your face was to have an utter resolve to accomplish a mission. So when Jesus set his face to Jerusalem, when he resolutely set out for Jerusalem, Jesus was what? He was determined to get to Jerusalem. He was determined to fulfill God's mission for his life, which would find him hanging on a cross. And unlike a lot of the other stories of Jesus' life, Luke kind of highlights Jesus' um, shift here and his, his focus early here in this passage to the centrality of his cross and resurrection to the story of Jesus. These were the most important truths that Jesus wanted to teach the disciples at this point and wanted them to have in the back of their heads as they're on their way with him on this journey. And that's what we're going to focus on throughout this series. Jesus wanted his followers, yes, he wants us today to understand his true purpose in this life. You know, the disciples understood maybe a little bit about why Jerusalem was important to Jesus and his ministry, but they certainly did not understand that their friend, the one they spent so much time with, their teacher, the one that taught them all this amazing stuff, this miracle worker, this healer, this son of God, that they had pinned all of their hopes on, that he would have to die. Sure, He would achieve glory, but it would come through what? Rejection and death. Not by seizing political power for himself. Jesus shifts the tone here to head towards the cross. But Luke doesn't begin this passage with the cross, does he? What does he say? When the time came for him to be taken up. Some of your passages of Scripture, maybe in your translations it reads, when it came time for his ascension. Luke doesn't begin with the cross even though he knows it's coming. Even though Jesus knows that his death is looming in the background, Luke ends with the big picture in mind. He doesn't say this. He doesn't write, as a time approached for him to be betrayed, as a time approached for him to be handed over to religious authorities, mocked and beaten by Roman soldiers, sentenced to die, nailed to a cross or buried in a tomb. No, Luke looks beyond all of that as Jesus did himself, beyond the suffering, even beyond the resurrection to the time of the ascension when he is taken up in glory to the right hand of the Father. You see, Jesus has just spoken about his suffering to his disciples, but that's not all that's on his mind. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, much later in the Bible. The writer of Hebrews puts it like this. It says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus knew his end was near. He knew his days were numbered on this earth to walk with his disciples. So what would he do? For lack of a better word, what was Jesus' bucket list? What did he want to have accomplished? What would Jesus do? Well, he would do what he always did. Jesus would still heal as he was on the way to the cross. Jesus would still teach as he was on the way to the cross. Jesus would still call people to follow as he was on the way to the cross. You know, in that passage of Scripture we just read, he did everyday Messiah stuff. He called down James and John from calling down fire on a Samaritan village, trying to keep these guys in check. Jesus was not merely resigned to the fact that he was going to die. Jesus wasn't moping his way to the cross as we might do if we had a hardship in our lives we were facing. He wasn't just putting on a smile and faking it until the end. He was determined to walk the road before him. Why? Because Jesus was already living in the victory that was going to be accomplished for us on the cross. Jesus was already living in that victory even as he was walking the road to the cross because he knew his death would not be the end. He knew that it meant our salvation. He knew that it meant our restoration. He knew that it meant that all things were now in the process of being made right again. 
Jesus knew that it meant the days were numbered for sin and death and for the evil that reared its head in the garden and tried to drag humanity down with it. Jesus knew the days were numbered. And since Jesus knew the road he was walking would end at the cross, he knew that all of those he would invite to walk with him would have to walk that road too. The road to the cross. And one more time, to get to that empty tomb, we have to go through the cross. For new life to take place, there has to be death. Are we intent in our lives on walking that road with Jesus? Are we intent on our lives, even if that road means that there's some suffering that comes with it? Even if it means there's pain on my journey, are we intent on walking with Jesus? You see, just as Jesus set his face, just as Jesus was determined to walk the road set before him, so too we also must determine whether or not we're going to walk it with him. Jesus doesn't grab us and say, you're coming with me. No, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me. See, as followers of Jesus, we're called to reflect day by day on where our determination is set. We're called day by day to determine where our faces are set in this life. You know, where do we set our faces? Where are we determined in our relationships with God and others? Will we love him with our all? Will we love others as we love ourselves? Um, Remember, Jesus had just told his disciples that they would daily need to deny themselves. They would daily need to take up their crosses and walk with him. When Jesus says... To daily do this, he's not saying when it's convenient for you. He's not saying when you get around to it. He's not saying, well, it's Sunday morning, I got to get up early and go to church. So I'll deny myself this day, staying at home and doing whatever. No. This is an everyday, Sunday to Saturday type of walk with Jesus Christ. And then when you get to the next Sunday, you roll it all back up again. This is an everyday walk with Jesus. How determined and how intentional are we at walking that road with him? You know, just after we read that he set his face for Jerusalem, some followers would come to Jesus, or would-be followers anyway. And they start calling out to Jesus and asking to follow him. And I want you to see some of these interactions because Jesus begins laying the groundwork that he had already laid with his disciples to these would-be followers that there is a cost that is associated with following Jesus. Listen to verses 57 through 62 of Luke chapter 9. As they were walking along the road, A man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Great, join us. No, what does Jesus say? Jesus said, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. So we have three potential followers of Jesus. Three people that come to Jesus and they're like, Jesus, I want to follow you. Let me follow you. Please let me follow you. That's my translation, by the way. You're not going to find that in there. But they want to follow Jesus. They want to follow this. What they don't understand at this moment is a soon-to-be-crucified Messiah. And the first potential disciple comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere. Well, Jesus lets him know something. Jesus lets this guy know that a cost of following him is a radical commitment. And that's a cost of following Jesus. It's a radical commitment. And Jesus directs in this guy's life a question, where are you placing your material security? Jesus said foxes and, and other animals. They, they have places to lay their heads, but it's not so with, with me. Jesus is letting this guy know, and any of us who would read it today know this, that placing our trust in Jesus is not placing our trust in any of the other stuff. It's placing our trust in Jesus himself. And by making this demand upon this guy's life, Jesus is separating himself apart from any other rabbis or teachers of that day. You see, disciples or, 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 or followers of rabbis, those teachers in those days, they would follow their particular rabbi to try to discover what it meant to learn from them, but also how to live like they lived. It was kind of a life enhancement sort of thing. And maybe in our lives we're guilty of that as well. Maybe we're guilty of, of wanting our lives to be my life, but I want a little Jesus here too. Jesus, I'll, I'll follow you wherever you want to go, but I also want to do this stuff. I want to drag this with me, and I want to be myself, but just with a little bit of you mixed in. 
Here we see Jesus' call as a much more radical thing than that. A follower of Jesus, to come after him, intent on following him, determined to be the type of follower that Jesus calls for, has a life molded in accordance with Jesus' will. Not their own, but Jesus' will. And that's what this guy didn't get in this passage, and Jesus wanted him to know. And after this first interaction, another steps up. And he he says, Jesus, let me follow you. Well, the cost that Jesus talks about with this guy is is the abandonment of self-interest. The man's response is reasonable, is it not? Let me go back and bury my dad. Let me go back and bury my father. And that would have been understood in that first century Jewish culture as the highlight of respect for family, to take care of your family's affairs. But what Jesus is saying here is that this even does not preempt my mission. (laughs) Jesus is saying even this family duty does not preempt my mission on what is about to take place. And Jesus requests at the outset, it might seem a little harsh to us. I know it does to me. When I read this, it sounds harsh to me. But it's not that Jesus was not compassionate to those who had lost loved ones. Jesus himself, in John chapter 11, stands at the tomb of his friend and openly weeps. And people are moved by the compassion of Jesus in that passage of Scripture. Jesus understands what it means to have compassion for lost loved ones. That's not what's going on here. You see, Jesus' eyes are set on a much different direction. Jesus' eyes are set on defeating the root cause of all death and the enemy that caused death itself. And following Jesus, what it means for humanity is to step into that narrative, that narrative of what Jesus is doing and fulfilling the promise of the Old Testament to crush the head of the serpent that that brought sin and death as the first humans made that horrible, horrible choice to give in. See, Jesus was one who was bringing in a kingdom where death would be fully conquered. And that's what Jesus' mind was set on. And in not so many words, that's what he's telling this guy. Let the dead bury their own dead. Instead, follow me. At the end of Luke chapter 9, another potential follower steps up to Jesus. You can kind of see that he's been waiting in the wings a little bit. He's heard these other two guys and Jesus give these, these other pronouncements of what they need to do to follow him. See, he comes at it a little more subtle. And he approaches Jesus a little differently. He understands that Jesus is not a common teacher. There's something different about Jesus. So what does he call him in Luke chapter 9? He calls him Lord. He says, Lord, let me follow you. And what's his request here? What's his request? He wants to go and say goodbye to his household. 1 Kings chapter 19, Elisha wanted the same thing. And he steps up to Elijah, and Elijah allows him to do it. So it might have been a little shocking for this individual here to hear Jesus not give him the same courtesy that that Elijah gave to Elisha in 1 Kings chapter 19. What does Jesus say in Luke 9, 52? He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus is drawing a huge distinction between himself and all the other prophets, even a great prophet like Elijah. He was not simply just a prophet in another line of prophets. Indeed, his ministry and his life were unprecedented. And so was his purpose. You see, a cost of following Jesus is leaving anything and everything behind that hinders your following. That's a high price to pay. If you were to go on a trip, especially in these days where gas prices are $25 a gallon, right? If you were to go on a trip, what would you take into account? Gas prices? cost of lodging if you got kids like mine you need to take into account how long it's going to take before you want to pull the car over and set them out and then you continue the trip and then you have to pay for somebody to come pick them up you know you got to take a lot of things into account what about the prices of our homes uh the cost of our kids education college is coming up for a few of them (laughs) sorry will um the cost of groceries or, or the cost of just living your life we take all these things into account do we not have we ever stopped and considered what it costs to follow jesus christ does it cost us anything is grace really free grace is a free thing it's the free gift of god jesus has paid the price for our sin our guilt and our shame do we believe this this morning he has paid the price for that stuff he has died our death that we deserved in our place but is there a cost involved for us consider this if you were to begin a construction project there's a lot of stuff you got to take into account you need a permit 
You need an architect, maybe you need electricians, you need plumbers, you need carpenters, you need all of this stuff. You need somebody to come in and furnish the place on and on and on. When you build, you have to know the cost before you begin. Why? So you make sure you can get to the finish line. You make sure you can get into that house, whether it's a house you're building, whether it's a business you're building, whatever it is. Later in the book of Luke, Jesus begins to talk about following him in the same terms. And if you want to flip over real quick, in Luke chapter 14, just a few, just a few chapters over from where we're at right now, Jesus begins talking about this cost of being a disciple again. And he brings it into building terms. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. We've talked about these other costs with these other three would-be followers. Here's another cost of following Jesus. Finishing what you've started. Finishing what you've started. Throughout the New Testament, it's brought into athletic terms, running the race well, fighting for the prize, striving to reach the goal. Well, here Jesus talks about building a tower. And he says, how embarrassing it would be if somebody had the foundation laid, they were ready to build upon it, but they didn't estimate the total cost. Now everyone in the village, everyone in the town, everyone in the area who walks by this will see this construction that was left behind and think, well, this guy didn't know what he was doing. (laughs) And he'll become a laughing stock to everyone to be a follower of Jesus. So easy for me to stand up here and say, well, You've got to have what it takes to finish. You've got you to be determined in and, in and of yourself to fin- finish it. I want to tell you this morning, no amount of your will, no amount of sheer stubbornness, which I'm raising my hand because I'm a stubborn person, no amount of American stick to whatever you want to call it, will get the job done. See, Paul writes much later in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that is, he who began a good work in you. He will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. If we set our faces towards following Jesus, no matter the cost to us, if we determine that we are going to reorient our lives around Jesus Christ, leaning into the very power and presence of the Holy Spirit who takes up residence within us, it is God who will accomplish what He intends for us as we lean into Him. I asked the question a few moments ago, what's the cost to us? If Jesus has paid the price for your sin, for your guilt, for your shame, do we still have to pay anything? Is it really free? Well, sometimes we lean to a couple ways of this. And uh, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he used a term about this that a lot of people lean into, and he called it cheap grace. And he wrote this. He said, cheap grace has brought chaos to the church. It is defined in several ways. Intellectual assent to a doctrine or idea If I put that in Matt's terms, that's knowing the Sunday school answers. (laughs) It's being able to answer the questions that are asked of you. He also says justification of the sinner without a corresponding change in his ethics. But he says grace, not cheap grace, but real grace, on the other hand, is dear and it is costly. A man or a woman must give up their life to follow Christ. Grace is dear because it costs the Son of God his life. But it's grace because God didn't count that too great a cost. What an awesome picture of the price paid for us and what grace truly is. You see, the life of salvation is offered to us by Jesus Christ. It's free to everyone. It's free to everyone, but it could only come through a price paid. Jesus knew this, and that's why he was so set to walk through the cross. That was why he was so determined to get to Jerusalem, even though it would lead to his eventual death. And Jesus calls for all who would come with him to take up their crosses and follow. You see, salvation is free, but the life of a disciple is costly. Remember Jesus' words back in Luke chapter 9, verse 24? If you don't, I'm going to read them. (laughs) He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. And that was what Jesus was going to do for us. He was determined to do that for us to lose his life so that we could find life. And he adds to it in Luke chapter 9, verse 25, these words. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very soul? Today, anyone who's hearing me this morning, whether you're in this room, whether you're online, if we are going to be intentional about following Jesus in this life, 
we must determine whether or not it is worth it to walk the road with him. I know where I've made up my mind. It's worth it. It's worth it. But for his disciples, it would have been shocking to hear this language. The language of the cross. The language of excruciating pain and torture. The language of of death. To follow Jesus, to take up your cross, it would have meant losing your life. But the peace that Jesus wanted them to understand was that losing your life for his sake, as big of a deal as that sounds and as big as a deal as that is, you also gain it back. And so much more through him. Losing your life for Jesus' sake is gaining his life for your life. Following Jesus at times, it may feel like we're losing what we once held close, what we once thought was the most important thing in this life. And the costs that he talked about with these would-be followers, what were they? They were, they, they were radical commitment, the abandonment of self-interest, leaving anything and everything behind that hinders you and carrying a cross. We can't walk that road without being prepared to follow him wherever it leads. You know, those who wish to follow Jesus in this life, they must understand that there is a surrender aspect to his call. If we aren't willing to, as that old song goes, surrender all, you remember that song? I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. I'm not going to (laughs) sing. But if we're not willing to do that, then we might still believe that we have the right to hold on to the pieces of our lives that we want to hold on to and not go all in with him. Not give everything completely over to him that he calls for. Yeah, Jesus came to die to save us from our sins. That is so true. And that is a tremendous gift from God. But he also came to set us free for new life. To live following him. Eternal life that stretches through this life and beyond whatever may come. He came to rule and to reign in our hearts and lives. That is why Jesus is saying to count the cost. Consider the price to walk the road he has laid before us. It's a high demand, but there's also high reward. His life for ours. What an amazing gift of God. What does following Jesus cost? Sometimes it costs us family along the way. Sometimes it costs us friends. Sometimes it just costs us the desires that we thought we had for our lives. And Jesus said, well, that's not my best for you. Maybe it's our security and our money and our wealth and our status and all of this other stuff. Whatever it is this morning, Jesus knew what it would cost him for you, but he was determined to go through with it anyway. Do you know that? Do you believe that this morning? He knew what it was going to cost him to love someone like me. And if I had a mirror up here, I would look at myself and I'd be like, you? Jesus loved you that much? And maybe you're thinking of that in your own life, but he did. He loved you that much. He was determined to die so that we could really live. You know, we were created to know God and to love God and to be known and be loved by Him, but sin, we know, distorted that possibility. It ruined that possibility for us. That this holy God could be in the presence of an imperfect and sinful people. It's not God's fault that this is a problem. It's ours. Because of sin, all of us have sinned, and we deserve that distance between us and God. The Bible tells us that because of our sin, we deserve death, but yet Jesus was determined to die that death for us. His death, the only way possible for all the sins, for all time to be dealt with. The only way in the relationship with this loving God. His own disciples, as Jesus is telling them all this, they couldn't completely understand it when he talked about his rejection, when he talked about his suffering, when he talked about his death. They didn't get the price that needed to be paid. But if Jesus weren't determined to do it, then we would be without forgiveness. We would be without hope for this life and the next. There was no way that it could be achieved but Jesus doing it for us. So what did he do? He determined to go to the city where this would all take place. He walked the road set before him, not because we are so lovable, but because he was so loving. Following him in this life, that's the question for us today. Will we follow? Is he worth it? Is it worth it to give up control of my life? Is it worth it to trust in him for what he gives me back when I let go? of my control over the things that Matt so often wants to dig his fingers into and not let go of? Pastor and author Tim Keller wrote this. He said, the real question is this, is there a God who is the source of all beauty and glory in life? 
And if following Christ will fill your life with his goodness and power and joy so that you would live with him, with his life increasing in you every day, if that's true, you wouldn't say things like, you mean I have to give up or deny myself and then fill in the blank with whatever comes after that. Let's say he says, you have a friend of dying of some terrible disease. So you take him to the doctor and the doctor says, I have a remedy for you. If you just follow my advice, you will be healed and you'll live a long and fruitful life, but there's only one problem. While you're taking my remedy, you can't eat chocolate. (laughs) Now, what if your friend turned to you and said, forget it, no chocolate, what's the use of living? I'll follow the doctor's remedy, but I'm also going to keep eating chocolate. He says, well, if Christ is really worth it, then all the conditions are gone. To know Jesus Christ is to say, Lord, anywhere your will touches my life, anywhere your word speaks, I will say, Lord, I will obey. There are no conditions anymore. We have to come to him and say, okay, Lord, I'm willing to let you start a complete reordering of my life. This morning, Trevor and Hallie are going to come and lead us in a song. And as we get ready to close and respond this morning, maybe that's a question we need to ask ourselves. Is it it worth it? Is it worth it to be so determined to intentionally follow Jesus? Well, it is if you think he's worth it. If you think he's worth it, then it's worth it for whatever may come in this life. Are you looking forward to the promise of Easter and new life and all that comes with it? I know I am. We celebrate it every Sunday we get together on this Lord's Day, this Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate it all the time, but Easter's the big deal. It's a day when the world's attention is turned to something just so amazing that Jesus was dead, but he's, he's not anymore. Are you ready for that and that celebration? If you are, then you must be willing to walk the road with Jesus to get to that place. And where does that road lead? Through the cross. Through his rejection. Through his suffering. Through his death. You know, it isn't easy following him and saying, well, I'm going to take up my cross. Awesome. Suffering, rejection. All of it. Let's go. It's not easy to do that, but it's necessary. It's necessary to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus and to be determined to lean into his strength to do that. This morning, I invite you to respond as he leads you. I know it's a little awkward sometimes to to pray in front of other people, especially if you're talking about kneeling at an altar in prayer. So just however he's leading you to pray and respond to this morning, if it's at your seat, do it. If it's standing and singing and just declaring his goodness through the song we sing, do it. But if it's also coming and kneeling and just getting face to face with God and saying, God, what is hindering my walk with you? God, what am I holding on to that you want me to let go of so that I can go all in with you? God, I want to do it. Whatever it is this morning, if he nudges you, lean into it. If he whispers, listen. But if it's a shout and if it's a shove, you better run to how he's asking you to respond, even if it's a little painful to do so. Will you stand with me this morning? Know this, it'll all be worth it because he's with you every step of the way.